Hi, everybody. Um, is that okay? Can you, does that sound about right, Ben? <laughs> okay, feels quite loud here, but that sounds, apparently it's a good thing for people joining us remotely. Um, so welcome everyone to Rebuilding with Stone, Ashler's Spoiler Quarries and Cities. Um, it's a day of presentations and discussion about stone, its use and reuse within architecture. Um, so I want to say thank you very much to all of our contributors um, who are joining us in person and online today. Um, and also to the guests who have um, joining us again in person and online um, and at the AA here. Um, and I also particularly want to thank the AA Public Programme Manager and the amazing work that the AAV team have done to create this hybrid format, which is a lot more tricky to make this seem effortless than you might, <laughs> you might think. So thanks so much to Ben and the team. So I just want to introduce myself first. I'm an artist um, and a tutor at, here at the AA, um, but my family also run a quarry and masonry works in Dorset and have done for several generations. So I have a particular interest in Purbeck Stone. And during lockdown uh, last year, I ran a course introducing AA students to stone and workshop processes. Um, and the work my students produced is the basis of an exhibition which is open all day today and on Monday in the AA gallery just opposite the lecture hall. So do pop in if you have time. Um, so this whole event is made possible thanks to the support of Wallonia Brussels Architecture. Um, and it evolved out of the commission that they supported, which is called Placeholders. Um, and this was commissioned by the VNA uh, for the London Design Festival in September 2020, uh, on which Audeline and I collaborated. So I just want to briefly, before we start the main presentations at 11, just give you a quick introduction to this, because this set the theme for today's um, event. So this is placeholders as installed. And it reused um, blocks of Portland stone ashlar that had been salvaged several years previously from the reconfiguration of the Aston Webb screen that you can see behind. So this is the screen as it was um, originally built in 1909. Um, and in 2017, or a little bit earlier than that, um, there was a plan to make this a new porous Victor, um, pedestrian entrance uh, designed by Amanda Levette. Um, so the screen itself, you can see to the right, is very um, got a lot of patina and character from its in years of, during of its installation in Exhibition Road, not least the World War II shrapnel damage it suffered, um, which was kept as a kind of memorial or evidence of the conflict. So as part of that um, project, um, this involved um, Giles Quam and Associates, who produced a very, very detailed survey of the screen um, um, to, in order to facilitate the, the removal of the, the, the complete dismantling of the facade um, and then its reconfiguration, which was all undertaken by Pay Stonework and Restoration. So we're delighted to have Robert Greer here from Pay, who will be speaking um, after lunch in session two. And this is um, from Pay's um, storage facility, where you can see all the stones having been carefully dismantled, stored ready for their reassembly. Um, but about 400 of the total stones weren't needed anymore. And it was costing the VNA over several years a lot of money to store this. And by a strange <laughs> number of coincidences, and um, it ended up being essentially offered to my brother's quarry because it was need not needed. So it was a possibility it could be kind of recirculated in some way. And so my brother took delivery of this and um, paid for the haulage, took it on. And it, so it arrived in the quarry on a series of pallets like this. Um, and you can see on the right, that was a drone footage that LA who produced a documentary took in the summer. So one of the issues we had when um, it seemed so perfect that, you know, Audeline, knew of that that my family had this material left from the VNA itself. So for the VNA commission, it seemed perfect to, to try and reconfigure this material. So one of the problems we had, even with such a well-documented project, was this issue of inventory, of how um, we work out um, a little bit of sort of forensic um, 
work based on the Giles Quam drawings, such as you can see on the right, but you can see that, you know, even with the photogrammetry, what was captured was only the surface of the stones. We didn't come with the depth. Um, so as kind of three-dimensional elements, we, we didn't know what that information was. So it took quite a lot of work to try and figure that out and to produce a kind of catalogue of stone for our use and possibly to help with its um, reuse after what was our temporary um, installation. Um, so this was actually a workshop we did last summer and you can see Ruth, who's our respondent in this morning session, geologist there, as well as Steve Webb on the right, who'll be speaking this afternoon. Sorry, not speaking, he's a guest and he'll be with us this afternoon, um, but looking at shrapnel damage, surface damage and so on. So this is the configuration that we came up with, um, which would also fulfill um, a job of um, acting as hostile vehicle mitigation for a part of the street, which has a lot of pedestrians. So we're sitting in the place of these sort of lozenges, um, which have been commissioned by um, uh, the Royal Bar of Kensington and Chelsea, RBKC, um, to be produced in Indian granite, but they haven't been made or they haven't quite arrived yet. So our work sat in on their footprints. Um, and so as part of this, we also sort of sifted through all the pallets and rather than um, taking them as a right, as they, as they came, we kind of organized them into unit type and sort of stacked those within the quarry. So the, the project supported a little bit of um, reorganization. Um, and we tried to do quite a minimal amount of um, reworking so that we were leaving some of the patina, but brushing it up a bit. And these, these arrows on the end are the original 1909 joggle joints. So it was a joint filled with mortar to help the coping along the top sort of knit together. So we just gave these a very light polish to sort of rub them up. It's actually incredibly hard mortar, which Robert <laughs> hadn't been anticipating when Pei took on the, the role, which was very challenging for them. So there was this very strong Portland, even with a flint ballast, amazingly, in some of the joints. But anyway, and so we washed, washed them and repaired them um, in a fairly minimal way. And then we also were making use of the codes that came from the original 1909 masonry, which were beautifully carved in a lot of the joints, but obviously hidden from view. So this became the top surface on uh, one of the placeholders. So we were kind of adding our own inventory uh, code system to the one that we'd inherited. And we wanted this, the, the quality of the stone masonry or the kind of active to sort of reveal some of these processes that are usually not just hidden because they're, you know, part of the process before a building opens, but quite literally hidden behind hoarding, most building sites, you know, that sort of, and so to have two of Pei's um, stone carvers actually carve an inscription into the top surface as almost like a public performance during the festival was a really nice um, way of celebrating that kind of activity that otherwise tends to be um, uh, rather out of view. So this is um, one of the placeholders on the first weekend uh, of the festival, super busy site. It's lovely to see them being used. Um, but actually this I think is hopefully a useful image to finish on because um, you can see four of the blocks that have been cleaned and ready to take up to London, the residual uh, stockpile taking up quite a lot of space in the quarry. And you can see behind that was actually a day when some of the waste happened to be being um, crushed. Uh, to, to be used as a aggregate, um, but that's that's the quarry's internal waste that only that only happens very occasionally, kind of once a year or so. Um, but actually, it is the fate of most stone and particularly demolition sites within the city. Um, and so I think this is hopefully comes into the themes that we're going to be discussing, particularly in session two and session three, is about how we prevent this. Uh, material that's about 150 million years old still has huge um, durability over centuries, if not millennia, um, and how we prevent this being discarded and um, uh, removed from, from use forever. Um, so on that note, I'll introduce the first three speakers this morning. Um, first of all, Thibaut Barriot. Um, here, welcome. <laughs> Uh, Thibault is an architect and the co-founder with Cyril Presaco of the Paris-based architectural practice Barreau Presaco. The practice's activity is shared between urban projects and metropolitan strategies, building conception and construction, research and teaching. Uh, Barreau Presaco is, have completed several housing building and load bearing, sorry, housing buildings in load bearing stone. Thibault graduated from Paris S School of Architecture, where he teaches today, and he has worked in Paris, Rotterdam, and Buenos Aires. Simon Barker, who will be joining us online, 
is an archaeologist with a DPhil in classical archaeology from the University of Oxford. His doctoral dissertation, finished in 2011, was entitled Demolition, Salvage and Reuse in the City of Rome, 100 BC to AD 315. He has since held several postdoctorate positions throughout Europe. His research focuses on a variety of aspects related to the ancient world, including the production and supply of materials for construction in the Roman period, ancient stoneworking techniques, spolia in the late antique and medieval periods, and the use of historical records and 19th century building manuals in Roman architectural studies. Michael Goyut joined Rota in 2008. Michael has been coordinating the FCRBE project led by Rota and carried out by a partnership of 11 organizations as part of the Interreg NWE program. The project aims at fostering the reuse of building materials in Northwest Europe throughout, through the development and guidance documents, the documentation of the existing reclamation industry and various communication efforts. Michael co-wrote and edited the book, Deconstruction et Reemployee, Apologies for my French, it's awful. It's not even French, I'm so sorry. Um, published in 2018. Um, Michael trained as an architect and researcher in Brussels and obtained a PhD in architecture in 2014 from the ULB. And just to say, we're also um, joined by um, Adam from Retruvius here, who is one of the partners in the organization of Interreg, uh, Interreg and WE. Um, and finally, we also have respondent Ruth Sidal. Um, Ruth is a geologist based at UCL. She's a field and lab based scientist with an academic research interest in mineralogy applied within the cross disciplinary and broad research themes of cultural heritage. She also has a specialist interest in the provenance of stone used in art and architecture and on the relationships between earth sciences and the built environment, or perhaps urban geology. Uh, she also co-developed the London Pavement Geology website, an app which archives building stones used in London and the wider UK. So she's a great person to expand a conversation about specialist materials that we'll be discussing this morning. So without further ado, let me hand over to Thibaut for our first presentation. Thanks, Thibaut. Good, good morning. Thank you very much for, for the presentation, for the invitation. Thank you, Adeline. Thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. Thank you for... Very happy to share with you my, okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so my name is Thibaut Baron, I'm an architect. Um, it's true that um, in our office, we're very interested in, in manipulating natural resources, such as stones, but we also use um, wood and, and hempcrete. And um, today I want you to throw three topics, three projects, some more exhibitions, some more small installation and, and others are a housing project um, to express some, some topics we are very keen on working with. And uh, it's, 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 it's rather um, raising questions and, and subjects and really uh, offering answers, unfortunately, today. But I think it's good as architect to have in mind that um, our, 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 our job now is, is rather kind of uh, developing uh, strategies and, and, and through research, um, raising collective uh, topics than just like showing images of, of what we do. So it's very important at the office and we're trying more and more to find through a kind of horizontal uh, structure of the office to uh, maintain this, this high level of incertitude and, and doubts in, in what we do. And I think um, stones and natural uh, materials, which are Paradoxalement, how can I say that? Um, kind of very old, but very new as well. So, so this is a kind of uh, for us very interesting. So, five kind of associations of words, form, and energy. Um, why? It's because we believe that today, um, energy and 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 carbon footprint um, should be more and more involved in the way we shape um, architectural elements and 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 to consider energy in in building today is kind of uh, amplifying this 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 old uh, story of of rationalism uh, that that kind of occurs in the middle of the 19th century and that could still happen today and that could still be a very uh, powerful method to 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 develop uh, shape and, and forms for architecture natural ground and and cultural elements is the way we kind of have in mind that today everything that you manipulate through building is uh, at their origin, a natural resource, whatever you do, 
But what's important is the distance, is the energy, is the numbers of transformations that are between these natural states and these cultural elements into the buildings. Transformation immediacy is, is related to the, to the previous one, and it's like, okay, through, and this is very specific to, to natural stones for us, it's, uh, and we've been very, very much interested in this topic, is the way that with just one cut, and that's something I want to talk about today, is just with just one operation, what's, what's, we, what we find marvelous with stone is the way that with just one cut, with just one single operation, which is kind of always the same, you turn from something which is totally innocent and natural to something that could be very cultural in just one very uh, uh, immediate uh, uh, operation. And I think in this moment, this is where uh, you kind of reach a certain uh, level of, 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 of architectural interest because you consider the energy uh, in this transformation. Monolithism and assemblage. This is the last two topics are very important as well. Is the, we believe that stone should refer to the whole history of architecture and not only a stone history of architecture. Otherwise, um, we believe that 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 aiming uh, this kind of just phenomenological and 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 kind of monolithic and archaism uh, way of looking at at stones is really reducing it to something that is just something that was already there before. And we believe that today, the, the, this kind of universal culture and the whole uh, architectural culture has to and have to uh, inform uh, uh, the building, whether in stone or, or in concrete or in wood or in whatever. So that's the last topic, archaism opposed to tradition. We believe that tradition is always kind of seeking and searching in, in architectural history while archaism is trying to escape from it. And, and to us, this is very different. And in our, in our practice, this is something which is uh, very, very important. So I'll go through and maybe too much images. So I'll try to be very, very uh, quick. And maybe I should have started the chronometer. I'm sorry, I forgot. Okay, okay. So this is the first, this is how we met Stone, basically, um, a bit more than four years, four or five years ago. I mean, studies started in, in 2015, but we submitted the building in, in 2018. So that's this building, which is here. I'll quickly go through implantation and urban strategies. So this is Rue Oberkopf, very, very important street in Paris, close to um, Republic. So the building is kind of uh, proceeding to an, an, an alignment on the street between one kind of late Osmanian style building of late, you know, 19th century. So kind of very thick and, and, and novel, you know, way of doing architecture and the end, let's say, of Osmanian style. And then you have this Faborian uh, kind of very dry uh, aesthetic, which is very, you know, this, 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 uh, and Paris is a lot of, you know, in between like this. So our building aims to connect the, 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 the you know, the bourgeois, the, bourgeois, the bourgeoisie parisienne on the left and the dry, uh, uh, very simple way of doing architecture on the right. So that's the building, that's the courtyard, which respond to an existing one on the, on the opposite side of, of, the, of, the, of the plot. And you can see these setbacks that are just a response to some urban reglementation that I won't really go into today. Um, that's the, 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 the other view. I'll, I'll, I'll quickly go just to, that's the plan, which, is, which start being important here in the plan is if I show maybe a, 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 building, a building site a image is, is the first topic in the assemblage. In the assemblage, what we like is to escape from this, this to me, fake idea of monolithism, of the way that when you build stone, you just build in stone. That's totally false to me. When you start building in stone, you have to also deal with many other materials that, has, that have to be connected with stone. And in the way you connect the different elements, and through uh, the question of assemblage, so the way you connect elements that are wood here, because the, 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 the floors are with wood, uh, the steel uh, structure uh, and the stone uh, and the load bearing uh, stone uh, facade, then you kind of understand that you're way far from, from monolithism. And, and, and then you have to start this kind of very cultural uh, uh, aspect of, of building. 
And through this, you start, you know, adding some new elements because you understand that with the addition of concrete elements, then you can, uh, you know, kind of uh, create some new uh, interpretation of, of stone and you can um, actualize uh, an escape from, from something that would only belong to the past. And through the use of, of this kind of material, you start also understanding uh, that also stone uh, have some limits. And when you want to offer some comfort and some light and some you know, very uh, pragmatic uh, uh, um, qualities for, for housing, then you can start adding some new materials and then you can start uh, escaping again from this uh, old way of, of, of doing building in stones. I want to quickly go to something more important, which is the idea of the cut. So, to some image, and this is and this is what I was uh, I wanted to talk about with the. So, in Paris and in many cases, um, the moment of the window is something which is very important, and this is basically what you mostly do when you do a building in Paris, because you have to, in such a in such a city like Paris. The, the 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 facade and 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 the and and the window the moment when you start uh, to express the architectural language and when you start to uh, define that you have to make through uh, the idea of light you start you know uh, creating this 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 uh, this architectural moment when you start uh, also uh, raising uh, some some um, some technical questions and 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 when you know that you have to from a void go on, on both sides, then you start uh, asking the role of the lintel and the aspect of the lintel and the form of the lintel. And from here, this is where we have to start and go uh, to, the, to the query and to the journey into the ground to understand how we, we reached uh, this idea of the cut as something very powerful to express uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, 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 the stone uh, uh, construction language, and on the other, also a more um, general aspect of architecture. So this is Paris. This is where the, the stones uh, come from. So that's the, the entrance of the quarry. That's the plan of the quarry. This is where uh, our stones, uh, where was the stones were extracted. Uh, you know, I guess, uh, landscapes uh, of, of uh, underground uh, quarries. So I, I, this, is, this is the only, as I said before, the only tool that you use. So that tool could be very big, like this one, the saw. It's a you know, aveuse. I don't know how you can translate uh, this, la aveuse. I, I don't know the word in English, but it's a saw. Basically, that's the saw. Yeah. Uh, and that's the only tool that you use. So you have big saw, you have smaller saws, but that's the only thing that you have in mind when you do this kind of industrial, you know, uh, 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 scale of, of, of building. And then you can see the other one. This is our stones being extracted. And then they, they lay and they kind of dry in front of the quarry. This is the stones that we selected. So when you start a building with stone, this was super fascinating for us is the way you kind of, uh, go to the market and select and say yes and no, and I like this one and I don't like this one. So you start having this very uh, direct uh, relation uh, with the material, which was to us very, very uh, uh, important and new. And you can say, okay, this is too yellow, this is too gray, or this is too much, and this, I don't want this tomato and everything. So you start doing the soup with what you have in front of you. So you kind of uh, consider the construction in, in, a, in a real uh, a manner. And then you displace, and then you enter the transformation. And then you have this last moment where here you can still, you know, have this ambiguity of this still belongs to, to the ground. And then when you start having this, this, this cuts, this, 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 this operations, then, then you escape. And then this, 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 this stone, this, this pieces, this, this piece of ground becomes some, in your mind, immediately uh, uh, an architectural element could be a column, could be a, a lintel, could be a, a piece of a wall. And, and, and through very, very low energy, because this is electric energy and, and, and the water that you can see is in a, is in a closed, um, a process so you 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 maintain the same amount of water all the day and then you understand that compared to concrete which is this diagram the process is super super light and super 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 um, um efficient so with just one or two productions so here you extract there you transform and there you you lay the stone in a very short amount of time and energy you turn from natural ground to to architectural elements and then you can see that's the process of concrete. And we don't say that we hate concrete. We use concrete and we will 
probably always use concrete, but it's just a way to rebalance uh, our, our, our relation with this kind of material. And then you can understand that if you go through history, you can re-look re at this old image that we all know from Le Corbusier looking at some ant ant antique uh, uh, runes. And then you can see that the stone could also easily go back from this, this, this arctic elements to, 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 to a piece of the ground. So it's, it's either in one way or like the other, just like the presentation you met before. It's, you can instantly consider this, this element as parts of the ground, of the natural ground, and also parts are, are, is potentially a, a part of, of, of architectural element again. And then you understand that the cut we produced here was the only way we wanted in a very economic uh, gesture, uh, inter uh, uh, interpret uh, uh, the relation between the Osmanian style, which was at the end of the 19th century, applying matter and matter and expressing through modern nature and through ornaments, very uh, complicated, let's say, uh, uh, gestures, but still around the window, then we try to, to maintain this idea of the window and the ornaments, but in a very, very more economical gesture. So this is kind of the same way of doing the building, but in rather to me in considering uh, the way you do the things and the way you manipulate uh, the materials. And then you can also try to refer to, through that, to some very, very famous from, I'm sorry, it's a huge reference, but this Alberti in, in the Palazzo in, in so, I'm super modest about this, but just a way to connect the, our work to, to this kind of beautiful building. Uh, it's the, it's the, the, the consideration you have again to stone history here, but when Albert is talking about the building, he's just talking about this building because he only uh, manipulates stones. So he's trying to say, okay, that's wall. So you separate the, the question of the wall from the question of the column. And then you kind of reach this kind of abstraction when suddenly you can still uh, express the, the skeleton and then through language uh, manipulate the idea of the skeleton and the idea of the walls, which was, you know, one of the most important question when you start building a, 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 a building with stone. So you always have to ask yourself, okay, am I doing a wall? Am I doing columns? And this kind of question raised from Alberti was very interesting. But you can also refer to some very different buildings, such as Edouard Albert in the Epargne de France that he did right after in, in 1954. And he was also expressing the idea of of building through voids and through, you know, when you do columns, you don't do walls. And when you, you know, through uh, this idea of, of the wall, you can also start, uh, you know, responding to the idea of the construction when you separate the idea of the wall and just the, the idea of the column. So this is basically another way to escape from archaism and to try to relate the buildings to, 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 to your stone building to something which is not built in stone. And this is kind of, you know, through the layout, this is what we try to aim. When you start building in a wall, you know that you can have these quincons, this layout of the stones, but we always forced ourselves to always uh, use the compression and use and, and lay out the different stones, only uh, one stone on each other without never applying some kind of quincons like this. So we always tried and aim to escape from the idea of the wall and to maintain this idea of the skeleton in, in order to refer this, to this kind of you know, idea of building architecture, whether it was in steel, us, it was in stone. So it's a grid basically, and then you apply the different stones on top of each other. And at the end, through the lintel and through the two gems on, on the two sides of the window, then you start expressing the idea of, okay, this is through this, this cut, then you understand like the inflection like uh, Venturi was talking about, your lintel is, 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 is doing this relation between the column and the wall and you start you know, relating yourself to some different kind of tradition, which could be Osmanian, which could be Albert, which could, which could be Albert, uh, Alberti, Edouard Albert and everyone. And then you also try to say, okay, I, but I also definitely through this kind of abstraction belong to this very Parisian history of charging the window, the, the window with, with, with intentions and with, uh, and with considerations. And then from this, from this building, we, Twelve minutes. I'm good. Okay. 
so we made this exhibition. I'll quickly go through the exhibition because we did the exhibition after um, after the building was completed. And that, that is important in our case in the office that we always, through the construction, raise the topics and make the research. It's from practice to research. And that's a very important uh, vector for us. It's not like we do research and then we apply them on the buildings. We are manipulating materials and then we raise the subject. So we made the exhibition right after I'll quickly go to the exhibition, which was because when we were doing our journey in the in the queries, this is when we this is this is how we realized uh, the discourse I have today is when we were doing the, the building, we're not very um conscious of, of the relation we had with the ground and everything. But that was the main topic of the exhibition, mostly was portraits of, of Parisian queries, uh, uh, geological uh, interpretation of the ground, uh, and to say that this is, uh, okay, and like you said, urban maybe geology, so this is two uh, different, uh, 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 um, in, 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 in dark brown, you have the, what we call uh, lutetien, and in lighter brown, you have like Eocene, which are two layers of stones. So all the quarries in Paris, this, this is Paris is here. Here. Uh, and so the, the exhibition was to say, okay, because the, the, the stones we use for the building, as just showed, was not coming from Paris, but coming from southwest of France. So we wanted to demonstrate the availability uh, of the Bassin de Paris to, to produce and to, 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 to be part of, the, of, of post potential stone construction. And that was the, just one image of the exhibition. And to say, okay, you can relate today through one cut. The idea of the ground, the idea of you know the geological resources and, and cultural elements, and this is how we want to make architecture uh, now and to, to think about architecture. And from this, we said, okay, we should do another installation, and this was a, a small installation we made in Versailles, uh, which were also connected to the previous topics, but which was more considering considering the idea of the assemblage and to say that okay. Natural resources should come from, you know, the, the site and close to the site, but you always have to find the balance between what comes from the site. So what's what's uh, um, well, from the site and what's not. And I think architecture should at some point link these two ideas of which is universal, which is cultural, because we have access to everything today and, and also a way to escape this kind of, again, kind of um, a vernacular way of thinking things. And we believe that uh, the balance is in between the resource, natural resource, local resource, and, and, and the access we have to, to universal culture. So this was the two uh, uh, materials we were using in the assemblage. So this was a picture from Jamie Meloni, a, a French photographer with whom we've been working a lot. Kind of portraits of the existing, uh, you know, materials resources. So this is where the exhibition takes place. This is where the stones come from, and this is where the wood come from. So uh, having this in mind, we try to say, okay, we should now uh, relate this idea of local uh, uh, resource to something which is at the opposite uh, uh, part of the world, which is a, a very famous uh, uh, wood, a uh, Japanese wood tradition of uh, assembling stone and 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 and, uh, and wood and uh, yeah, stone and wood. This is granite, but still. But we also try to use something which is totally abstract from you know the very famous as well and and voluntary very famous uh, first uh, you know uh, idea of uh, variation of incomplete open cut from some Lewitt. and we say okay we should natural resources local resources. The idea of abstraction and something that belongs to a totally different culture, and then we mix everything and we start playing with the different contractors on the left side. And here you have the the wood being being being, being cut by Benjamin Gorich, and then you have the stones, and then at some point you have these different elements that are all totally independent, and then you start assembling in order to organize a very mechanical uh, you know interaction between the things and to set. Uh, 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 um, uh, a balance here yeah, between the different things, a detail, and then this very simple object which which aims to express the idea of abstraction, of 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 construction, of tradition, of newness, and of natural resources. And here you can see it in the in the in the factory being uh, finalized. 
And just to finish, um, let's say that Rio Bercon was some kind of a prototype. And, and now we, we just won this competition a year ago of, of a load bearing facade uh, tower uh, in Paris, but it's the kind of same uh, interpretation of, of stone. So I'll just very quickly go to that, just to say that, well, that's the plan. And the idea of assemblage is still the same. So we have this, just to go back to the plan, this is concrete the first the ring, and this is wood, and then this is uh, load-bearing stones. So it's exactly the same principle that I just showed uh, to Rue Oberkampf, the first building. And we still play with this idea of assemblage, this idea of uh, to hybrid the different elements in order, so that's, that's, the, that's the structural elements and that they have the second oeuvre elements. And at the end, you built you know, this, this idea of, of, of um, yeah, I want to go quick. This is it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, is that okay? Thank you very much. That's a really great start to the day. Thank you. Could we move to the uh, to Simon, who's one of the um, online presenters? Um, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, good morning. It's a, a pleasure to uh, uh, to be here today to get to share, uh, I guess, an antique perspective on uh, recycling. Uh, so, as I said, if everyone can hear me and see my presentation, I'll dive right in if that's okay. So, um, what I really like to do in my presentation today. Uh, is just present a few brief remarks on three different things. Uh, I want to start by having a look at just this sort of concept of stone in antiquity uh, and think about um, the Roman period in particular uh, and think about what made stone uh, such a, what well, gave it such a social uh, and cultural value. And then I just want to share a few brief remarks on labour and cost. Uh, that really uh, sort of, I guess, endowed uh, material antiquity with what we might call a stored value. Um, stone, as has been seen already in presentations, of course, had to be hand worked. And this, of course, demanded a level of manual, technical and technological skill. And then I'll find, finally finish by looking at some various kinds of reuse practices in antiquity uh, and some concluding remarks. So as it probably comes to no, no surprise to everybody in this room, reuse, of course, is a sort of timeless feature. Uh, and I think a very good example of human resourcefulness. Uh, and this aspect, this desire to recycle was one that was also appreciated in antiquity. Building materials and architectural spaces have always been adapted to suit new contexts across all levels of society throughout the ancient world. And this was for a variety of reasons, and we can cite things like pragmatic uh, and or symbolic. And it's, I guess, a part of pre-industrial economies, which could generally not afford to waste surplus material. The reuse of early building materials in ancient context has generally been referred to under the guise of spolia. And it really is this monument shown on the slide here, the Arch of Constantine in Rome, dedicated in AD 312, that really is one of the iconic ancient models of recycling. Uh, these days, modern scholarship tends to go with the more simplistic label of reuse, which doesn't really carry the sort of semantic baggage that spolia has become associated with. But evidence for reuse can be found across a wide range of formats and not just architectural, but also statuary, uh, statue bases, all kinds of things and all kinds of material. So marble and, and stone being prominent. But of course, in antiquity, we could cite bricks and roof tiles, etc. And it, it encompasses the practice of things like direct use. And here I'm thinking of reuse columns when columns remain columns. Uh, and placed in new contexts specifically because they were columns and often selected and arranged because of their existing dimensions, colors, or having a matching set, a certain number of them. Alternatively, 
they might be reused for completely new purposes. And this might mean smashing up and using in foundations, as we heard about stone earlier today. And this was quite common as well. And indeed, white marble was a tar targeted specifically because it could be burnt for lime. And of course, all these kind of different responses were depending on the period and, of course, the need of the user itself. But I really want to stress here that throughout antiquity, reuse was really a booming industry. And indeed, so this remained uh, in later periods, uh, particularly uh, in cities like Rome, where, of course, centuries of Roman construction endowed the medieval and early and indeed early modern Rome with a seemingly unlimited quarry of material. And there's no better uh, thing to demonstrate this than the material that is travertine quarried in, in Tivoli just outside Rome. And you can see the modern quarries here on this slide. Until really until the 16th century, uh, travertine was sourced through recycling. And indeed, uh, the quarries were actually only opened in the 16th century to, to basically cater for Pope Julius II's extravagant project, that is the building of new St. Peter's in the Vatican. Before that, as I said, almost all travertine was sourced from ancient monuments. One 15th century contractor, Giovanni Lomb Lomborda, was actually granted papal permission to remove a staggering two and a half thousand cartloads of travertine over the course of nine months. So a huge amount coming off what is now one of the most famous monuments in Rome. What I think is important to stress in antiquity, that stone uh, was brought to ancient cities from all over the Mediterranean world. And it is actually vast amounts of material we're talking here, quarried in places like Egypt, North Africa, Greece, and the Aegean Islands. And people generally are quite struck by the amount of, and particularly the long distance movement of stone. We have uh, shipwrecks of star stone cargoes weighing as much as 350 tons. And you can see, uh, as this, hopefully this photo shows, you know, we're talking about some staggeringly big objects being moved about the Mediterranean. Uh, these are abandoned, roughed out columns in the, in the Trode granite quarries in Turkey. And you can see their location in sort of north, northwest Turkey on the top left of this screen. Um, originally, most stone generally quarried in the ancient world was sourced locally and designed to meet local projects. But as the sort of fashion for stone became increasingly, Romans sought ever more valuable and more fashionable stones. And so a sort of high quality demand for decorative stones grew, so-called foreign rocks, as they're labeled by a fifth century poet. And I can show the sort of staggering array of material that could be found by just showing one villa that I worked on, Villa Aeta Plantis on the Bay of Naples in Italy, where at least 14 different varieties of marble could be found in the fourth star decoration. That is AD 45 to 79 here. And you can see it's sourced all over the entire Mediterranean here. So you really get a staggering sense just in one, uh, what is actually a relatively normal villa uh, in the first century. So here we can see in a snapshot the taste for foreign rocks in the Roman period. And I'm sure this bit will be emphasized throughout today as well. But this sort of cultural cachet indeed basically uh, came about for both the effort that went into transport and indeed all the labor that was behind the use of this kind of stone. And I think one of the best ways here to show it is some uh, historic photos from the Carrara quarries in the 19th century here. And you can see, you know, here various shots of the quarrying process going on, soaring blocks. Uh, and you really get a sense here of the scale of some of this effort, the oxen in the bottom left-hand corner, the amount of uh, sort of animal power needed to drag these blocks out of the quarries. Here, of course, uh, the quarries set quite high in the mountains require quite a complex process of lowering the stones via sleds, uh, lizza, as they're known uh, in the 19th century uh, Carrara parlance. And, and here we have to remember, particularly the Carrara quarries, that when moving uh, stones, as was often the case, over quite steep slopes, it required a huge amount of coordination and skill. One of the things I think that really stands out for me about stone and recycling is that it is just such a suitable medium for recycling. 
And I just wanted to show three things that really emphasize uh, what you can do with it. I talked about earlier columns being reused as column, but the very nature of stone, of course, lends itself to quite staggering amounts of recarving and quite interesting examples. And I just put three, uh, three on this slide, which hopefully kind of illustrate, illustrates the point I'm talking about here. Um, the uh, left, I don't know if anybody's been to the Colosseum in Rome, but most people often walk past this, this capital, uh, which is quite near to the entrance, but a sort of careful view of the top shows its original origin. It was a block from a monumental inscription. And of course, the carver that transformed it into a capital saw the raw resource that this, bottle, this, this block of marble could offer uh, in the middle uh, a veiled togator statue uh, recarved from a column shaft. And you can see that very clearly at the back here the evidence of the original column that it was carved from. And indeed, in the far right hand process, you can see this process in, in, in action, as it were, in this font, uh, with the sculptor chiseling away this beautiful Byzantine decoration, uh, which uh, to most people would probably think, why would you even do this? But there it is. So I think. You know, first and foremost, the Romans understood the value of recycling. Uh, in particular, they understood the necessary the necessary means of disposing of huge amounts of demolition rubble. And in the imperial period, uh, this was able to be churned up in the typical mortared rubble construction of the Roman period and recycle this waste material, stone, but also brick and wall plaster and even amphora. And just to divert from stone ever so briefly, I would like to show an example of sort of crunching the numbers, as it were. And this is one of the best examples, although it's non-stone. Here you can see the Circus of Maxentius on, off, off the Via Appia on the outskirts of Rome. And here, olive oil amphora recycled into the vaulting. And you can really see the efficiency of mortared rubble to be able to dispose of this material. Uh, and you can see the number crunching here that I was talking about. Here uh, you have, by recycling, tens of thousands of Dressel 23 amphora, you know, providing 1.25 to 2% of saving on materials. And you think, oh, that's not such a big amount. But then, you know, when we think about it in terms of cubic meters and cartloads of materials, it does actually become quite surprising amount of material that this kind of recycling was able to save. The Arch of Constantine, which I mentioned earlier, recycled roughly 16,000 blocks of material uh, into each arch. In the Roman period, most of this material ended up, as you can see here on the Porticus of Octavia, uh, in the Severan period, that's the early 200s uh, or late 200s, uh, uh, early 200s, uh, recycled into invisible sections of the building. And you can see how easily here uh, the Romans were able to churn up all of this material. In terms of the sheer quantity of material, I can't think of any better examples than some of the late Roman walls uh, that were dotted about the Roman Empire in terms of churning up recycled material. Uh, and I show some examples here from uh, late Roman Gaul, uh, the walls at Sant. Uh, here, uh, these sections of it were actually dismantled uh, uh, just outside of a nearby hospital in the, in the 1800s. And you can see here uh, in the middle, middle image, uh, the core of the wall has actually been removed at this period. And you can see quite clearly all of it stuffed full of architecture materials, of course, clean blocks on the outside, but inside in this shot, uh, you can see uh, the architectural origins of all the materials. And this is, you know, able the Romans to deal with a lot of material here. I want to stress again this, this point of uh, needing to negotiate the urban fabric uh, as you rearrange it and reconstruct it over the course of, of antiquity. And this became uh, an increasing problem uh, over the course of antiquity, obviously, as more and more cities had more and more major um, monuments constructed. Um, just before sort of finalizing, one of the things I also want to emphasize here, and I think this will come up again through the session uh, throughout today, is what's often sort of forgotten and I think is very evident in the Roman period is the sort of technical 
aspects of recycling. Uh, and we shouldn't we shouldn't underestimate these or, for instance, the middlemen that were involved in the process. Of course, you know, this is one of the great things about the recycling industry and antiquity was exactly the same. All the middlemen in situating themselves in between uh, the actual dismantled monument and, of course, the end user, the people organizing and selling reused material. Um, to again just refer to the Arch of Constantine very briefly, the some of the Aurelianic reliefs uh, weighed in excess of, I think, about 7.5 tonnes. Uh, so those had to be dismantled and then lifted back into place. And the fact that none of them were damaged shows how, just how skilled, I think, Roman builders were at this. Uh, I can point to two uh, instances of actually very specific uh, dismantling and re-erection that has more of a connection to modern restoration projects. And this kind of activity actually took place more often uh, than is actually realized in antiquity. That is the actual dismantling of an entire monument, labeling up its pieces with numbers so it could be put back together in the correct order. And I show two examples here. Uh, a, uh, st the, the stadium church at Sagalossus in Turkey uh, where blocks were numbered in line uh, so their position could be, uh, uh, so they, the blocks would be re-erected unless they were dismantled from the Temple of Dionysus. And on the right hand, some blocks from the Temple of Ares, which is one of the most famous examples of this, which uh, during the Augustan period, uh, an entire temple from the nearby countryside was actually dismantled uh, and moved to the Athenian Agora, block by block, uh, and reassembled, uh, which uh, required a staggering amount of uh, technological skill and thinking about how you could do this and required all these very careful assembly marks. And to get a sort of sense of the idea of, of this sort of project, although this is perhaps uh, on a completely different scale, I couldn't resist showing again the UNESCO project here to save the Temple of Philae. Uh, you can see that on the right, uh, the temple in the process of being dismantled, uh, and on the left, the entire monument laid out on the floor, 47,000 blocks of it. And of course, this had to be carefully labeled so it could all be rebuilt in a new location. So this gives you a sense of what, uh, although it would have been on a smaller scale, what something like uh, the Augustan builders faced with the challenge of dismantling a the Temple of Ares from the nearby countryside and moving it to the Athenian Agora. So to conclude then, I've hope showed a, a, a variety of different sort of responses and different types of things in antiquity. I think what I really want to emphasize is recycling is not a modern phenomenon. The motiv motivations for benefits of reuse and recycling are, of course, multivarious. Therein lies, I think, the attraction, practical, financial, uh, symbolic, aesthetic, all sort of coincided. So too, I think, the reasons for reuse in the Roman and late, an and late antique and medieval periods you know, ranging, as I said, from all of these kind of things made it such an attractive uh, form of building. We should not forget, as I've just emphasized, that reuse and recycling not only requires ingenuity, but also this technical skill, and it could be legitimately demanding and involve navigating all the kind of things that uh, are still the same, I guess, in the modern construction industry, things like ownership, acquisition, storage, reworking, transportation, and then the need for entrepreneurs, craftsmen, workforce. And this, I think, is a very important way to think about it. And it's something, again, that we see in the modern period as well. Um, the Romans evaluated redund redundant material as a resource, and they were able to optimize and use it as a resource. And I think the wide practice of recycling really shows that. And at times, it showed a very sensitive attitude towards heritage. Uh, and as you know, this is something that I think uh, is really well worth sort of considering and thinking about the lessons of antiquity and how we might then apply them in the modern building industry today. Thank you very much. Hopefully that was uh, uh, interesting for everyone. Yeah, that's wonderful, Simon. Thank you very much indeed. No, you're welcome. Um, well, I hope you'll um, stay with us if we then pass over to Michael, who's also sure, joining, sure. joining us remotely. This should be it, isn't it? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, great. 
So yeah, thanks for the opportunity to come to speak about Fernand Pouillon. He's a strange character, a French architect from the second half of the 20th century, mostly active at, at that period at least. I have to say that I'm not a specialist about him, but I was quite fascinated by, by this figure. And, and, and so I, I possibly read uh, a lot about him and, and a lot about uh, what he wrote. So I will try to share with you uh, why I find it so so interesting. And it, it's a complex figure. Um, of course, in 15 minutes, uh, it will be hard to cover everything that that, that is to say about him. Uh, so I will just um, offer a glimpse on his career and, and his thoughts. Uh, I, I think to start with, we can say that Fernand Pouillon was a man of contrast. Um, at some point of his life, he was extremely wealthy, but he also knew bankruptcy and financial, financial crashes. Um, he built huge developments in the French reconstruction after World War II, uh, but he considered himself as nothing more than a humble craftsman. Um, yeah, that's maybe the, the reason why, why I'm here today. He fostered building with stones when everybody else was praising concrete. Uh, and I will come back to that later, of course. Uh, his views on architecture were almost mystic. Uh, and he wrote a beautiful novel about a monk erecting a Cistercian abbey in the south of France. It's really a, an interesting book, uh, but that did not prevent him from managing one of the biggest architectural agencies of his time in France. Uh, and he was also involved in many other companies and businesses. Uh, and we will see that it, it did not always uh, went well uh, on that side. He was a very hard working guy, entirely dedicated to his project, sacrificing his family life. And when you read his memoirs, it seems that he did not sleep a lot during his life. Uh, but at the same time, he had a reputation of being a heavy jet setter. Um, and it, he was infamously known for his jabo shirts and silk tuxedos. Um, and maybe that's the, the, the most... Um, a particular side of, of, of this character is that he, he, he spent some time in, in jail. Uh, and not only that, but he managed to escape his jail. Um, actually, it wasn't a jail at that moment. He was uh, imprisoned in a, in a hospital because of health problem. And so that possibly facilitated the, the task of escaping. And he escaped and hide uh, for... Uh, a few months before making a spectacular comeback uh, in front of the court uh, when the affair uh, in which he was involved was presented uh, in court. And it was completely unexpected. And he came with a like a, a, a big um, file of papers explaining uh, his whole life and th this document would become later his memoirs that, that would be published as a, as a book. Um, so the, the, the picture that you see there is, is, is this particular day when he, when he made this, this comeback. Uh, so it's about 1963. At that point, Pouillon is already 15 years old uh, and has already a long career behind him and a few major realizations to his name. Um, so he started his activities uh, just before World War II um, in Marseille, in the south of France. Uh, his family was into the construction business, so uh, that was a, a relatively uh, easy start for him. Uh, he, he spent a bit of time in the Beaux-Arts school in Marseille, but that did not interest him at all. And so he did not finish his studies uh, before World War II. At that moment, uh, it was possible to um, work as an architect, even though you are not trained as an architect, but that changed with the institution of the order of the architects in France in 1940. So he had to, to get a diploma somehow. Uh, and that's what he did. Um, one of the first major realization to his name is uh, for the Vieux Port uh, in Marseille, the reconstruction of the, um, the built uh, structure in front of the, of, of, of the harbor of Marseille. Um, and that was quite a big realization. Uh, and already there, he, he demonstrated a, a, an ability to deliver projects uh, that are built very fast and very cheap with a relatively high quality in, 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 the, in the final um, architecture. 
Another important step um, is a project for Aix-en-Provence. That's not the one you see on screen. I, I, I didn't find a, a good picture of it, but uh, it was in 1951, for which he built 20, uh, sorry, 200 housing units in 200 days for 200 million francs, uh, which is approximately uh, 300,000 euros uh, or 250,000 pounds uh, of today. Uh, so it was a very good punchline, but also uh, quite a, a massive success. And a key factor in, in this experience was uh, using stone, using massive stone as a way to, to keep the cost relatively low uh, in, the, in the construction. Uh, and this is a feat that he repeated in 1953 in Alger, where he was called uh, by the mayor of Alger uh, in Algeria, so under uh, French uh, occupation, let's say. Um, and there he built two massive housing developments, Jar Es Sada and Jar El Masul, sorry for the pronunciation. Uh, so in total, 2,600 uh, units. Uh, and there again, he used stone that he imported from quarries located in the Gare, in the south of France. So we see another example of stones uh, crossing the Mediterranean Sea uh, from, from north to south in this case. Uh, and then he started what we could call his conquest of, of Paris. So he, he was really attracted by, by the uh, construction sector in, in Paris. And maybe you could see uh, a hint of, of complex of someone from the province trying to go to the capital of, of, of France. But you could also think that's probably where all the, the major projects were were at that time and so there he, there he went and uh, a first operation that, that he built was for Meudon La Forêt um, between 1957 and 1962 uh, and it went pretty well uh, it was a, uh, considered as a, a, as a success and it still is uh, it ages very well this this building it's quite impressive and there again the use of massive stone was was quite central in the in the construction um, and then this is the project uh, where the shit hits the fan, if I can say. It, it was for uh, Le Point du Jour in boulogne billancourt so really close to, to the city of Paris. Um, and actually, that, that, that's the project that, that sent him to, to jail. Um, and, and of course, he, he is very bitter about this, this situation. So I could spend hours trying to explain what happened. But basically, it was part of an association, uh, a sort of a real estate company that he co-founded with, with other people. Uh, and the business plan was to sell the apartments to the buyers and use this in, in advance on plans. And they used this money to finance the, the works and the contractors, uh, except that among this partnership, among this consortium, uh, they used the money for themselves uh, to, to pay very high fees to the, to the administrators. And at some point, they couldn't pay the contractors anymore. And so they had to stop the, the site and it became a big affair, a, a huge scandal. Uh, and that's uh, what... Um, yeah, sent him to, to in front of the court and, and in jail before that. Um, and so this is an, an extract from from a, a magazine of that time. Uh, it's yeah, it's hard to translate, but it really reads like a detective novel, uh, and and it's yeah, it's it's somehow very spectacular. What is interesting is that um, at some point a journalist asked to Fernand Pouillon. Uh, what do you think about this idea that some people made uh, made him out to be a scapegoat in this affair? And his answer is, is spectacular. He says, um, "I think you are convinced of that." And 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 and, and that's that's an important aspect that probably um, was discussed later on. At that moment, it it, it was. Yeah, sort of shitstorm for him and, and the complicated period. But later on, other people started to, to try to reread this affair. Uh, and that's the case of Bernard Marais in this uh, very good book, uh, Fernand Pouillon, L'homme à abattre, The Man to Kill. Uh, and he explains that, of course, there was a fraudulent use of the money of, of, of the buyers and, and, and there were problems in this, in this uh, consortium and in this company. Uh, so somehow it was legitimate to, 
to uh, present them in, in, in court uh, and to mount proceedings against them. Uh, but on the other hand, he says that um, the trial was quite stern and harsh for Fernand Pouillou and unusually harsh and unusually stern for that sort of, of affair. Uh, and, and the hypothesis of Bernard Marais is that possibly Fernand Pouillon was presenting an alternative to uh, the dominant construction industry of that time, uh, for instance, using stone instead of, of, of concrete, uh, promoting a model in which uh, people have access to the ownership of the housing units uh, by contrast to uh, um, social housing where people uh, just lend the um, uh, the apartments uh, and so uh, maybe th there was something more than just the, the, the affair in itself it was like a, a sort of um, alternative way of, of building things that, that was also uh, judged at that at that moment. And so I think it's it's a very relevant hypothesis. And if we try to understand how, in effect, Fernand Pouillon was able to build cheaper and faster and possibly more effectively and more qualitatively than, than other uh, contractors and architects of that time, uh, it's interesting to reflect upon the, the tools he used to do that. How, how, how did it come? Uh, how does it come that, that how does it come? I'm sorry, that, that he was able to achieve those results. Um, and so, yeah, in this section, I, I will present a few hypotheses that you can find in, in writings uh, from him or about him. So I think a very important aspect uh, is that Fernand Pouillon tried to keep the control of the works as much as possible within the responsibility of the architect. And so, for instance, he avoided all the intermediaries um, between the, the design and the actual uh, construction, the actual build of, of, of the building. Uh, and therefore, he invented what he deemed to be the first technical consulting uh, of France, uh, which was not an external consultant. It was really within his agency or a sort of department. He saw it like that, at least a department within his uh, agency that was in charge of supervising the, the work. And that allowed him to bypass uh, the need for a general or a main contractor. And so by suppressing those intermediaries and contracting directly with the specialized trades of the construction industry, it could keep the, the cost relatively low. Uh, so th th that's an important uh, aspect, I guess, in, in his work. Uh, another important aspect is the close contact he tried to maintain with the workers on site. Uh, and, and, and he really... Um, yeah, he disliked this idea that there was a, a, a strong separation between the design on one hand and the build on, on the other. Uh, it seems that he spent quite a lot of time on the uh, building site. It's especially interesting to read about it, the, the relationship that he uh, built with the workers in Algeria. Uh, of course, because of the general context, it, it's it's... Yeah, there is a layer of, of racism and of classism in, 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 in his attitude. But on, a, on the other hand, he seems to to be very respectful towards the, the, the workers and that they, they gave it back to, to him and, and, and respected him as, a, as an architect close to, close to them. Uh, and if you, yeah, it's a bit omnipresent in, in his writings, this, this idea of uh, keeping a close contact with the, with the workers and, and considering the construction site as an important, uh, maybe the most important uh, part of architecture in, in, in general. So that's, that's maybe the second uh, aspect. The third aspect is, is a sort of a yeah, vision with, of architecture with a capital A uh, and, and the notion that architects should be more responsible for the work and should not uh, subcontract these aspects to, to contractors or to uh, what is worse to him, the, the, the technical consultants. Uh, he, he really would like to have something more integrated in, in, into the practice of, of architects. And so it, it's hard to translate. He, he has a style in French that is um, very vivid. And, and so I, I'm afraid that my... Uh, homemade translations do not pay justice to, to, to his writing, but you really um, feel his bitterness and his uh, aggressivity towards engineers, for instance, or uh, general contractors. It's quite fun to, to read, at least in, in, in French. 
Um, and then, of course, the use, the materials that he used uh, are another very important aspect uh, in, in his practice. And I, I think he, he has a, a very interesting position and attitude towards the choice of materials. So he, he used quite a lot of uh, what we could call traditional materials, especially when he started to build in other countries such as Algeria or Iran. Or, uh, uh, but, but even in France, he, he, he used, for instance, massive stones or wood um, in a period where everybody else was using prefabricated concrete or, or for, for the, the same type of, of projects. But on the other hand, he's not... Uh, is not dogmatic about that. It's not that, and and, and I guess this interview with him uh, at the end of his life uh, is quite explicit on his position. He is, uh, on, uh, you could say, a sort of opportunism on one hand, and and he really appreciate the qualities of those traditional materials. But on the other hand, he also uh, felt the need to to be aware that industrialism in a way was ineluctable and, and, and that you had to deal with that. And probably he, he built up a, an interesting position uh, holding the, 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 two, uh, the two ends of, of the stick. In the, uh, so traditional material on one hand and industrialization on, on, the, on the other. Um, and so if you speak about stone, in fact, he was involved in the development uh, of the mechanization of the stone extraction in, in the south of France. He indirectly owned uh, a quarry, um, not directly because uh, at that time, and I think it's, it's still the case, it, it's forbidden for an architect to be also a material uh, manufacturer, but indirectly via his collaborators, he, 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 he was a stakeholder of, of, of this uh, stone quarry, especially this one, uh, the quarry of Fontvielle near Al, and he really contributed to help the development of the industrialization of the stone cutting. Just at, after World War II, in this quarry, uh, the stone was still um, cut by hand, uh, but they progressively adopted new machines that they, they are very similar to, to those that uh, Thibault presented in his uh, presentation. Um, and basically, they adapted machines that were already used for wood working and for metal working, but they adapted them to to to, yeah, to cut stone and to prepare th those blocks, which was a way to keep the the, the cost relatively low. Uh, and this is a, a spectacular picture of the uh, construction site of Meudon, uh, so the the big project in Paris that went well, <laughs> by contrast with with the Point du Jour, uh, and you see the the relatively um, yeah standard size of the of the block and the quite primitive way of installing them, which is very interesting. Somehow it, it's quite low tech, uh, but at a scale that is quite unusual for low tech approaches. So yeah, to, to conclude, uh, I will <laughs> borrow the words of Joseph Abraham, uh, a French historian of architecture uh, that, that summarizes pretty well the, the, the point I tried to, I tried to make. Uh, this idea that Pouillon upsets the architectural establishments the builder's lobby and the major administration of, of his time um, and this position towards the ineluctable industrialization of the production process, but um, combining that with his love for um, traditional materials. Uh, and as Abraham uh, writes, Pouillon proved that the fate of traditional materials was not decided yet as long as modern production and implementation processes could reduce the costs of the construction site. So that's a very short uh, overview of Fernand Pouillon. Uh, I, I, I checked and I'm not sure, I, I didn't find a translation of his memoirs into English. That's a pity because it's really a good, good book. Uh, I recommend it to every uh, French speaking uh, architect and, and student in architecture. Uh, I think someone should uh, with more ability than I should uh, take over the challenge of translating them in, into English. It would really benefit the, the, the debate. So yeah, thanks for your attention. <clears throat> Wonderful, Michael. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think, um, Amaya, have you got the uh, some questions in the chat to, to moderate? Have you got a list? Check Hi. one, check one. Hello. 
So we're ready to start our Q&A. Yes, please, uh, whoever wants to ask a question in, in the hall, uh, raise a hand and we'll come over to you. And whoever is joining us online, please post your questions in the chat. So we have a question from Rivadi um, to just in general. Uh, so the question is, is stone dressing labor cheaper than pouring concrete or casting labor? I think we should address this question to, okay. to you too. Uh, that's a good question. Um, it depends on, 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 the deficient, on the definition of costs, I would say. Uh, and, in dip, and it also depends on uh, the thing you compare, for instance, I would say also. Uh, let's say that to us now, the idea of the economy uh, is augmented with the idea of carbon and energy. And this is what we're trying to defend to this kind of uh, question we've been opposed to uh, through when you start building in stones. So if I'm honest, yeah, in France, first part of the question, would, the answer would be yes, it's a little more expensive than casting concrete. But then when you start uh, you know, embracing the idea of the economy through the topics we've been raising with you this morning, I would say that it's way cheaper because of you know, the, the carbon and energy involved in the construction. For instance, now if I'm a little pragmatic uh, for the, the, the building Röberkampf, the first one I, I've been talking about, uh, the, the costs of the structural part, which is more or less in each building in France between 45 to 50% of the cost of the whole building. For that cost, building in stone was around 15 to 20% more expensive than a kind of, let's say, a more, um, I mean, than casting concrete. So it's not so much, I would say. But, but we, we are very, very interested in, in the idea of, you know, uh, overlapping the idea of the economy through different topics and just cost. And also because of you know the thing you compare to, for instance, now the the the, the concrete uh, constructive system are totally uh, I mean uh, consu are consuming way more energy and carbon. So this is something you should not compare to anymore. It's just like food. It's just like many things now. Of course, good cheese, like great cheese. I mean, <laughs> the local you know an interesting way of doing cheese is way more expensive than something you will buy into plastic. But it's just, you know, a different way of, you know, um, considering the thing. So you can maybe build a little more expensive, but build less, just like you buy better cheese, but you buy less. Or, you know, you can go through this kind of topics in, in any case. And I think the, the, the act of building is also a way of doing less, but doing better. Hmm. Can I ask a follow on question from that? I was thinking um, there's a lot of discussion in the UK at the moment about post Grenfell about ownership and liability in facades, for example, mm -hmm. and how that works with a model of ownership in the UK. I wonder in France for the apartment building you're talking about who owns that and therefore the sense of longevity of comparing long long term maintenance and repair costs for concrete versus stone going into centuries, which is you know, you might have a nine, 999 year lease um, like you do in London sometimes. So it's, I wonder if that's a part of a, an equation as well. No, it, it is. It is indeed. I think uh, in our case, the first building I showed was um, social uh, housing. So mm -hmm. so it's true that it's very different in the maintenance and the cost of the building and the the, the, the way we renovate it in, 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 the, in the times is way cheaper. And and social social developers, for instance, the client was RIVP, which is a very important uh, French, I mean, Parisian social housing developer, public developer, um, is involved in this idea of, of building in very long terms, rather than, for instance, maybe some, some private contractors will aim to sell the building at the end of yeah. its construction, and that will leave uh, the, the maintenance to the people that will buy the apartments. Mm -hmm. So it's true that it's a very different uh, relation uh, with the act of building from you know the, 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 the client point of view. Mm -hmm. True. Um, yeah, there's another question of how do you compete with the imperviousness, so the waterproofing abilities, of concrete cast versus stone masonry? 
the, the what, sorry? So the water, so how do you compete with the waterproofing abilities of concrete cast versus stone masonry? The, the comparison between the two? Yeah. I, I don't know, it works. <laughs> no, no, I, yeah. Um, com competition between like the waterproofing? Is that, is that better? Which one's better? Uh, um, I mean, you have regulation. So in, in the DTU, I don't know how to translate that, but the kind of uh, technical regulation that is related to insurances in France, uh, you have, if, if it's load bearing uh, facade, you have to use at least 25 uh, or 26 centimeters of, of, of stone masonry. In, in concrete, it is 20. So let's say the technical uh, response would be, no, it's not as much efficient as, as concrete is in the subject of waterproofing because you will less, you will use less concrete for the same kind of uh, performance, I would say. Can I pass that on to Ruth actually? Because so Ruth is a geologist. I was thinking as well that we've been using the word stone um, as if it's all the same stuff. And, uh, and, uh, yeah. and I think, you know, we mentioned in Simon's yeah. talk about those different marbles at Villa Aplantis and so on, but thinking of about perhaps that question with the wide range of stone yeah. that's used in London's fabric. Exactly. I mean, this is one of the things actually, one, one of the things I was going to talk about myself afterwards, you know, was that, you know, it, stone isn't just stone, it's all sorts of things. And I also work quite a lot on uh, concretes as well. And so I think I would answer that. Well, there isn't a, dis a difference. I mean, um, granite will make the most effective rain screen you can possibly imagine on a building. The problem between these materials and their relative amounts of porosity or imperviousness or whatever you want to say, it, it's the joins between them that are the problems. It's where one becomes another. That's, you know, where things can go wrong. And, you know, you, you I'm sure you see all these, I see a lot of these, you know, medieval churches that have been repointed with Portland cement, modern cement, um, you know, and that has destroyed the stone. Whereas if you use a lime cement, which you might think of a non-waterproof material, the stone will be preserved and they work together. So it's combining these materials is really important. And, um, you know, and I, and I think, you know, stones, stones are on this architectural level, level stones are not porous, you know, they've, they've stood in the natural environment for hundreds of millions of years. They're still there. That's why we can quarry them. Mm. So, um, and actually even limestones, which are porous, very much so in a, or some of them are in a geological sense, um, you know, they often, they will develop a pattern and, um, and actually, I think it was you, you showed the picture of the quarry with the, the stones put out to green, as we would say in English. Well, actually, I'm not sure we would say that in English, but yeah, it's like putting green wood out for it to, to temper in the environment. Season. season is the word, yeah. And, um, you know, you the reason you put it out to season over winter is that it will develop pattern on the surface, which will preserve it. Mm. And you will destroy that pattern if you then wash... Yeah, pressure wash your building, which is why Portland Stone is failing in London because it was washed too much in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Mm. But if they hadn't washed it, it would have been black. I know, but <laughs> you know, there are other interventions you can do. But it's they're good materials, they're not really porous. Mm. Also, just wanted to follow as well, thinking of the, the facade photographs that you showed from the Paris building mm -hmm. and thinking about the thermal performance of stone compared to concrete and how costs about running costs and insulation, whether that was integrated or whether the, being in France, perhaps with a slightly milder climate, as you go further south, you maybe have a different relationship with insulation or, or rules and regulations about specifying that? Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, it's true. I did not mention it, but we've, we, we, we use a, a lot. It's the fourth maybe building we're doing with handcrete, which is maybe a uh, from our point of view, one of the, the stone best, best friend, if you consider the envelope uh, through mechanical and also thermical uh, uh, performances. Best friend also because uh, it's not the best and we're keen on working with material which are not the best. It could be weird, but um, performance again is kind of, um, to us in the industrial point of view, a way of reducing uh, the, the and, and, and using materials which which will be more performant 
but which in many cases use uh, way more uh, energy to be productive. And with the use of hempcrete, it's not the best because you have to use a little more than kind of uh, petrochemic uh, 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 as a materials. And when you add, you add the two, you have what we call a pers perspirant. Yeah. Well, yeah. Vapor, vapor yeah. yeah, exactly. So like you, like you were saying before, um, you 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 use the idea of the porosity of the stone, and and with the hemp you kind of regulate uh, hygrometry and and, and 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 interrelations between outside and inside. So, so the envelope is not let's say a super uh, separation between what's inside or what's outside, but it's a more uh, temperate way of regulation. So you can feel the season inside the building through the exchanges of vapor through the envelope. So it's very important to, to us, yeah, to, to associate uh, hempcrete with, with stones. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's another question for Simon, and they would like to thank you very much for the fantastic and fascinating talk. Um, so number one, in your conclusion, you mentioned ownership. Could you expand on how this was negotiated in antiquity? What socio-cultural framework unlocked reuse, aside from the value of material and their embodied labor, from the perspective of ownership slash property? Um, yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting uh, question uh, in particular. The, the thing, what I would start off by saying that um, in a way, just like in the modern period, reuse was one of these things that was very, very closely regulated. We have actually quite a lot of laws regarding demolition, and there was a a very keen interest in preserving the ancient cityscape. And we see these rules over time sort of get eroded away uh, as increasing sort of pressure was put on the empire for a need of materials. But you see kind of laws, in a sense, uh, prohibiting the sort of denuding of a city of its like precious architectures. And you need sort of very careful permission uh, on occasion to transfer, say, like columns from one city uh, to the other. Um, what on the same time, having said that, in terms of this sort of regulation, um, it's also very clear in this sort of demolition laws that as long as you were rebuilding, you're allowed also to filter out. Uh, the old materials. And we hear about this uh, from, uh, for instance, from Cicero uh, says that, you know, often one of the kind of decent things that you should do when uh, talking about the refurbishment of a temple is to actually let the old materials, let builders take away the old materials where they can actually then sell them, reuse them. Uh, and so I think we have to see this kind of uh, cycle of rebuilding and reuse being very much attached to that with, uh, you know, builders absorbing the materials and then perhaps uh, selling them on. And we, 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 there is quite a lot of evidence for that archaeologically. Um, in terms of ownership, we have uh, lots of little snippets about this. We actually have uh, the ones that we generally have, actually, in terms of where we know uh, we can see sort of uh, middlemen taking ownership of, of blocks or things is actually when they actually inscribe their name uh, quite literally with a chisel onto a block to say, you know, to put their name uh, of ownership on it. Uh, one of the really fascinating examples of that actually comes from the Forum of Augustus in Rome, uh, probably from the sixth century, where a uh, local aristocrat uh, basically called uh, Patricius uh, uh, Decius uh, actually sort of puts his name on one of the great, huge, massive, several ton uh, column drums. Uh, so he claimed ownership. And so what you probably actually see, particularly in the late period, is people actually probably sort of fighting for ownership of these kind of really quite impressive sort of, uh, of buildings. So there was it was a clearly uh, a negotiation, I think. Uh, between uh, between the two things. So, yes, it was it's sort of ownership, I think, is a very important thing to think about uh, in terms of like how it worked in antiquity. I wonder Hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> I wonder if I could just uh, follow that. We mentioned about like the different variety of stones. I thought it was fascinating what you're saying about the variety of marbles in the Villa Plantis. 
within Rome, do you get a sense that the, the fashions for different or taste for different stones changed? Or was that a feature of the size and scope of the empire or other logistics? Because I imagine there might be some interesting parallels with the kind of um, tastes that have defined London um, in more recent times. Yeah, yeah, for definite. You definitely get a sense that over time things become more or more fashionable, less fashionable. Uh, and, and you can see that. What you sort of uh, see quite a lot throughout the Roman period is as, as time goes on, uh, you know, the, the Roman sort of quarry prospectors, as it were, are constantly looking for like, you know, new marbles. And one of the best things that actually amplifies this, I think, would be like the Egyptian desert uh, with uh, them delving quite deeply into the, the eastern desert uh, in places like Aswan uh, and looking for increasingly these kind of interesting granites and things like that. But we, you can see it as well that there is uh, a certain taste and hierarchy in stone, for instance, just to, to go back to the kind of area of, of, of Villarea Plantes. Uh, what you can see is um, quite fascinating, really, actually, in some of the rooms uh, that really use a marble stone. There's one particularly at the house uh, of the Telephus relief where you can quite clearly see they've assembled the stones uh, so that they place all of the kind of, shall we say, late Republican stones, these sort of local limestones. So they actually are located under uh, couches effectively. So all the new polychrome materials are the ones you can actually see, whereas all these kind of old uh, local limestones are being hidden under sort of movable pieces, pieces of furniture. Um, but then having said that, if we flip, uh, say, another uh, sort of 50, 60 years into the future at Hadrian's Villa at Tivoli, uh, to go back to there, you actually see Hadrian, who was quite a sort of antiquarian and looked back a lit to sort of Augustan models and things like that, actually uh, reuse, actually not reusing, but actually like bringing a lot of these local limestones back into his pavements alongside uh, coloured marbles. So this kind of old aesthetic actual aesthetic comes back in uh, in later periods as well. So there definitely is, you know, people try, you know, people uh, moving between what was what was fashionable, really. Mm -hmm. And just to follow up the topic, uh, there's another question to Simon. Um, how was value negotiated between the disassembly and reconstruction of monuments and their disassembly and the reuse of component, components in other projects? What considerations or pressures drove these decisions? Um, I think the things that sort of probably drove it was, I guess, part of the individual need of the builder, the, the builder and the user at the end and what they actually uh, needed or the access. We have to, uh, I talked a little bit about stone obviously being shipped around in huge, large quantities, but you know, for certain levels of the sort of social economic uh, level, like stone would have also been um, a scarce resource. So like the need always to effectively to find more of this material, you know, emperors may have had unlimited budgets, but that's not true of every single project. I think one of the things that really did drive it is actually the pressure on urban uh, the urban environment. I think that's very, very clear because, um, you know, you can see here the need to actually dispose of all this material that was generated in a sense that, you know, uh, they were faced with a very real pressure, particularly in really large instances. And I'm thinking here of, say, uh, the fire of Nero in AD, uh, AD 64 in Rome, where they had so much material to uh, to dispose of that you can see in the sort of the buildings that follow that in the, in the sort of mortar rubble, you can just see huge, huge huge volumes of stone, quite clearly from huge amounts of cleared buildings through the city. Uh, in terms of, I, I guess, thinking in terms of negotiating the kind of value, I mean, that's a sort of interesting thing. I don't know if you mean sort of value in terms of sort of uh, profits, uh, you know, loss and profits and things like that. Uh, I mean, if, if that is what the sort of question sort of relates to, I think that there presumably uh, was a very Re very, very real profits. And I think, you know, we, we have, unfortunately, this is one of the kind of things that we don't have a lot of evidence for of how much uh, materials actually went on sale for, how much we do have, uh, for instance, at Pompeii, there's a old uh, Republican painted advertisement for the sale of secondhand tiles. So that certainly implies, of course, people were selling this uh, and, and certainly making value out of it. Um, and, and cities certainly looked to capitalize on this value. The, one of the things I'm, I'm really uh, 
a minder here is a, a papyri from Oxyrhynchos from the from the fourth century, where we don't know exactly the the terms in which it was was commissioned. But what it seems to be is a person that effectively is going through a city um, out in Egypt and um, effectively going through probably after some kind of disaster, maybe an earthquake, uh, and they're going through the city actually, going through the inventory of materials, columns, capitals, and things like this. And the things they note are: is the column still standing upright? Is it laying on the floor? Dimensions, colour. Uh, and it, it's quite clear this inventory is really assessing the value of the material and how it can potentially be, be reused. Uh, and I'm sort of mindful uh, to link that to something like um, some of the um, reports that we have from uh, the demolition of the Septisodium in, in, in Rome, uh, which where we have uh, the notes about all the demolition and things like that. And again, there they were sort of writing the same town, right, okay, send this material off to this in Rome. This can still be used for this for its original use. This should be taken away and broken up. So they're always, you know, I think they're really very, very keen and right from a get-go would be very clear about assessing the sort of value of the material. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, I have a question for Thibault. Um, so the facade for one of your apartment buildings is um, quite flat. And I wondered if you um, considered the uh, possible weathering of the stone during the lifetime of the building, because I know some of the decorative elements from the classical architecture, they have the purpose of uh, throwing away water from the facade. And I wondered how in a modern type architecture where the facades are usually absent from uh, the decorations, how is weathering prevented in those cases? Um, no, indeed, it's, it's, it's flatter, I would say. But um, we applied um, a soft, uh, how can I say that, um, a layer of protection uh, on the stones. Uh, to prevent from water and pollution, which is more important in Paris than, than the water itself. And then on top, you have very, very, very thin um, hard stones. Because you have, I did not go into detail, but you have two types of stone. You have like soft stone, let's call it this way. From, And then you have hard stones. They don't come from the same quarry, by, uh, by, uh, by the way. And uh, some of them are, are more receptive to water and the hard ones. And the soft ones are more fragile, let's say, and the, the hard ones could be laid horizontally and then and then water can fall on them uh, without, uh, you know, um, destroying them in the time and soft them are more like horizontal and, and the water can can slide. But then you have we applied this 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 small layer of protection. But it's true that th that's a conversation we had with the contractors at the beginning. And it is true that it's not the way um, they were kind of um, suggesting us to do the things. They would rather, you know, apply some some thickness and some débordement and some mode de nature to protect uh, the stones, which we did not do. But uh, at the end, with this layer, it's it's going okay. Let's 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 see how it longs. But uh, it's a good question, basically, because it's it's basically this kind of uh, the the absence of modern nature, which was uh, which had at the beginning some some protection purpose, uh, is now absent of 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 our uh, way of building the things. Mm. So it could be naive. So I totally aware of that, and, and this level of of abstraction sometimes can be uh, difficult um, for the building to hold? It's a good question. Yeah. It's a very good question. Can I ask? Oh, go ahead. Hi. Um, my question is for Thibaut as well. OK. Firstly, I really liked when you describe, um, you describe this one cut. Uh, that charges the raw material it was very beautiful. And it might link to the previous question, but would you specify um, a role that suits better to this restriction of one cut for the stone in the scale, in the architectural scale? Sorry, say it again, the role of? This restriction that you mentioned ah. of one cut, um, does it suit uh, one role or architectural role better for, uh, better than the other? 
In our case, it's true that we restricted ourselves to, to one operation. That was at some point the, the kind of rule that we applied to the design process, I would say. Um, and also we were trying to, to, to read uh, the roles of the different elements that constitute uh, the window. And in this kind of Osmanian you know, way of, of dealing with uh, ornamentation, uh, so we were you know, fascinated with, with the role of, of Mother Nature to express this Parisian style at the end of the 19th century. And we were trying to respond to that through the idea of the economy. So same topic, but different you know, uh, time. And, and, and we believe that economy today is a, is a great ambition, economy of energy, economy of carbon, economy of everything, economy of building. So we were trying to say, okay, what is the minimum we can do so one cut was, you know, the single operation that at the end was able, on one hand, to dialogue with the existing Osmanian style. It was also a way to, 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 to maintain the idea of the window as a moment of, of investigations, as formal investigations. And three, the also this kind of maybe complicated idea of the inflection that I kind of talked about a little bit, which is part of contrad. Uh, co um, um, complexity and contradiction of architect in architect, you know, from Venturi, when he says, okay, at some point, one element has to refer to, to the parts and also to the whole. And with this cut, we were able to, to, to express the idea of the window that belongs to the whole of the facade because of the, of, because of the lintel that, you know, joined the gems. And then through this cut, you also reveal the idea of the skeleton, which is also something which is more abstract and more connected to the whole, I mean, to the difficult whole, like you want to say. So it's like many levels, and it's and it's something in our practice with, with the team that we are very interested in. And this is why at some point uh, we aim to refer when we when we manipulate you know the stone environment, which we don't really you know control at all, but we just try to link this to some you know, whole uh, uh, architectural history. Mm -hmm. And this cut at the end was, you know, we met many models, many research, and that, that was the, simp the, the most simple gesture, I would say. And this is something we're very interested in, the simplest and the most, you know, efficient in, the, you know, the, in this idea of economy of means, economy of energy, economy of everything. Yeah, and Can, just another question. Can I? No? Yeah. Quick okay. one. <laughs> Um, just a very practical uh, question. I imagine you test the ideas before you jump into the large scale of actually quarrying the stone. Would you 3D print or cast or how do you do that in terms of models? No, we do uh, wood or, or, or cardboard models mostly. But this idea of the cut, honestly, it's, it's something that came from, you know, the, the, when, we, when we looked at the soul. So it was before the models. It was something we this this and and I really appreciated the 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 talk of uh, the the when Michael was extracting the idea of the of the site, which Fernand Pouillon is trying to you know connect people from who builds and who design and who do the conception and who do the construction, and and Stone is really into that. Is really into interaction, social interactions between people and the design process here. Um, comes from the discussions and the, you know, the interactions and the, the knowledge we acquired uh, through the journey in the quarry. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a very important topic that Michael raised uh, in, in, in its presentation. Yeah, actually, I want, I want to ask Michael a question about exactly that, yeah. this, this idea of the cut. Um, I was really struck by, in your talk, when you say this is, you quote Puyon, this is a technique that has evolved because the life of man is too expensive. There comes a point when time is too expensive to use people in this way. And it seems like I think the clarity and simplicity of the cut is a very beautiful thing. And I think with the French quarry technique, quite often it's a mat, it's a just a machine draped direct from the quarry face. But I wonder how where this leaves the relationship with stonemasonry. Because actually, the, uh, and it's interesting how this has evolved in Puyon's era. I wonder, Michael, if you might be able to expand on that at all. You mentioned that he was involved actually as a quarry owner. Um, how did that work with the relationship with labor? Or was actually labor essentially erased and replaced by a single machine? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. To be honest, for Fernand Pouillon's query, I, I, I don't don't know the answer. Um, 
but I guess in this case, it, it, it was a sort of a, you know, compromise. And, and that's the sort of compromise that the modernization is always uh, facing um, and, and raising. And, and it, I, I guess it was a question of either the quarry would completely stop and be replaced by concrete production and, and, and other industrialized materials or stepping up and, and, and trying to compete. And obviously, I guess the, the amount of level of labor involved in, in, in the process must be lower than it used to be like 50 years before that or even 20 years before that. A story of modernization, but somehow I, I, I guess Pouillon found a way to, yeah, to find a, a, a sort of a yeah, in between position or at least suggesting uh, alternative pathways, and, uh, and 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 that's maybe the thing to to take to take on board from from his career. Thank you. May I just ask Odeline whether we have more time for a couple of questions or whether we should finish for now? It's a question for Ruth and Julia um, about the ecological impact of extracting stone. So we're having this conversation because we're, we're at a point where the internalization of externalities like carbon footprints is making stone an economically and morally viable material again. But it, like, is there an analogy with um, renewable energy where you know, we all wanna to transition to it, but if we do, it's gonna necessitate thousands more silver mines around the world. So I, I have no idea about the, the actual environmental impact of stone quarrying uh, compared with you know, rare earth minerals but could you just talk a bit about um, the impact of that mining, maybe compared with the production of concrete? There's nothing sustainable about using stone, but it's it's localized. Um, do, you, I mean, do you mean when you say sustainable, as in it's not renew, it it's doesn't not renew itself? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. To be clear, there, it's not you know, and therefore it's not sustainable. You know, it is better to build with wood. You know. Um, but you know, having having said that, um, obviously I wouldn't be sitting here right now if I were not a great supporter of using natural stone in building. You know, and I think we should do that. Um, but you know, it's not going to come back. And I think the more that we can reuse stone, the better. Now, in terms of environmental in impact of a quarry, that depends what you're quarrying and how you're quarrying it. And it is usually quite localized so there will be a local impact on that quarry but not necessarily a regional or a global impact of that quarry and and it depends where the stone is being quarried so if you're quarrying stone in Europe there are regulations in place on health and safety um, because it's a, da it's a dangerous <laughs> risk riven job um, running a stone quarry and you know so quarrymen need to be protected for men and women to need to be protected and you know um should be on a decent wage and all that I, I fully believe and that's why stone is expensive uh western stone is expensive and you know you if you go and buy sandstone from Rajasthan that's been quarried by children you know you should be questioning your your impact on global economy and <laughs> quality of life um mining rare earth elements much more polluting generally of the environment. Um, rare earth elements are called rare earth elements because they are rare on this earth and they may be locally abundant, but in the kind of places that they do occur, um, not the British Isles, not Western Europe, but places like Africa, Australia, South America, the Cratons, geologically we call them, um, people are exploited and pollution is not controlled and it gets into river and these things are incredibly poisonous because they come in association with heavy metals like cobalt and arsenic and lead, you know, which are, which are polluting. So, it, you know, at, at the end of the day, what I'm trying to say is at the end of the day, it comes down to management of that quarry resource and how that impacts 
of quarrying can be confined to a local area rather than pollute a huge area. And, you know, and, and I'm sure, Juliet, you can say your, your family's quarries probably spend a lot. I know from what your dad has said, there's a lot of time talking about whether we can build a new quarry in this field with the locals and you know there's a lot of PR that goes there and people are very scared of um, the impact of geological prospecting I mean you know look, look at look at what happened with fracking you know it was a total PR disaster um, and again you know people get very worried about dust and trucks and earthquakes and all the sort of things that go with quarries. But, I'm, you know, you can answer more about the management of sites and how you've got to contain those sites. Yeah, thanks. I, I think um, I should say, though, this I've got a very anecdotal um understanding of that's very specific to Purbeck um, rather than talking globally and looking at the quarries in France, for example, they're on a... 10, 20, 30 times the scale of the kind of operations in Purbeck, which are very localised in the corner of a field and then they're backfilled and then it moves and so on. So in terms of kind of broader impact, it's almost like a rotation of grazing that might happen over a cycle of a few years. Um, the extracted material is then backfilled. There's usually a planning constraint plus the practicality. You don't want to shift tons of stuff and then have to move back again. Um, but the externality, I mean, my dad said that the one big difference in this ancient tradition that in many ways you can see in the exhibition next door, you know, the hand tools that used today haven't altered mm -hmm. massively. Um, but the one thing that has made a huge difference is the internal combustion engine. Mm -hmm. And that the whole quarry operation, actually, if you look at who's employed in the business, we have one guy who who's just drives large machines every day. Um, and most of the men do in various ways. We've also got forklifts. Um, so even if we're buying renewable energy to power the, um, the source, um, actually, at the moment, until really good the similar equation, as you mentioned, for the wind turbines and so on, um, until there's a really good enough battery <laughs> that could have the power that, to drive a JCB, which is in apparently in delivery, or they're, they're in process, but it's not there yet. But again, that's actually pushing the impact of that to extractive processes elsewhere in the world, you know, that are finding the rare earth metals needed in the battery. So it's not without its impacts. And I think the other thing we should bear in mind is certainly in Purbeck is that historically in the 20th century, the, the internal combustion engine allowed all the quarries to be open, open cast, i.e., you know, you scrape back the top soil and then extract the stone. But in the 19th century, the quarrying was done essentially like mining, that you dig a small hole and bury down and get into a seam. And the seams are so narrow and it's really moving and quite sobering to go down into some of these that it's still open through Purbeck, that not open to the public, but you can find them. Um, and men were spending their working lives in the pitch black, in clay and wet ground, working on their knees in spaces that might only be kind of that high. So sometimes you can't even stand up and they're removing these blocks that are naturally faulted, but using sort of metal bars to manipulate these pieces of stone onto little trucks and then they're getting brought up to the surface using animal power. And it, it would be very naive to think that that's a future people would look forward to. You know, we think it's progress that we've moved away from that, which has a very, very minimal environmental implications. So I think, you know, it's a really important part of the industry and the discussion is actually how we balance the longer, um, as you know, in Puyon's buildings and the buildings you're describing, the benefits of stone as a material that um, doesn't have the same carbon footprint as um, co concrete, but it's not zero. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's so, not going to come back. You know, you can't uh, replant the forest. No, you can't. Yeah, and and also even if we used all, and at the moment, you know, with the ultra low emission zone in London, you can't bring trucks in or most trucks that have the power to shift very large volumes of stone are still 
um, diesel or internal combustion. So I think that's changing. Maybe Rob, Robert will be very well placed and Adam actually to talk about this <laughs> this afternoon. But I think, yeah, it, that's the, the major question to address. Yeah, and if I may add something about this topic, which is very interesting, it's um, from my my experience, which is still very, very young, and uh, I, I might be still a bit naive about this, but I was also, um, through the first uh, visits of the queries, um, very interested in the, the, the visibility of the scarf, let's say. And, and, and when you start talking with other contractors, such as uh, Simon and, and and still and everything, it is very hard to visit and to talk and to, you know, um, experience uh, the, 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 the act you do on the planet because, because sand comes from other parts of the world and everything. So I think the idea of like uh, viewing and seeing what you do through building the gesture, what the, the, the act of extracting and, and transforming, I think it's a very mental, um, you know, um, it had a very, very important, you know, let's say, uh, mental consequence uh, to me and to the team to see, okay, what I do here is I, I take parts of the fragments of, of the planet and I, and, I, and I do build with this. And I think that's very, to me, mental thing that was very, very, very important at some point. And I think through that, you, you, you deal with the economy because you're trying to extract as less as possible and you're trying to use as, as less as possible and then you start going to reuse and things like this uh, through, I mean, through to me, the, the, the first visit that we did. I think, can I just say, that's really interesting and what you said about the scar of quarries. And it, as a geologist, I do not see quarries as scars mm -hmm. on the landscape, not at all. They are um, essential for the understanding of the science, which is very much an observational science. And without quarries, we can't see that three-dimensional section a lot of the time. You know, you see fresh rock in quarries, even, even in, you know, Roman quarries, it takes a long time for rock to, to weather down. So, you know, in terms of my education as a geologist and, and then teaching uh, sciences, um, going to quarries is just what you did all the time because you learn from quarries and it's because of you know looking at looking at rocks has enabled you know the, enabled us to understand climate change it's you know it's not it's not about extraction industry it's about learning about earth changing mm -hmm. environments and quarries are essential for that and i don't want to so, sort you know I, I personally i do not see them as a plot of the landscape or kind of drawn to them you know we wonder what we can see in there that we couldn't see in this normal landscape and in perbet that is so important because you know you, you obviously you've got the cliff exposures which again are magnets for geologists but um but you know again it, it's the quarries that you see the fresh rock in and it's a real i always find it a real privilege to go to a working quarry and you know because you can't just walk into them obviously um but to actually go to a working quarry and see those fresh three-dimensional surfaces four-dimensional surfaces because we work in time that's really really interesting thanks Ruth. i wonder if i can ask a question i know we're a bit strapped for time <laughs> we've got the, the sort of blasting question. through our schedule but yeah <laughs> um it's for thibault actually um and i think it's so it's great that we've started you know rebuilding with stone um but given the amount of waste generated from the construction industry i wondered if you also thought about the stones deconstruction um from your building and it's a potential eventually reuse. Um, and as we've seen from Simon's presentation, stone lends itself easily to be reused and reworked. Um, and I wonder if salvaged stone from a building due to be demolished is a material that you consider working with. Um, so from the mine to the urban mine. Um, and you spoke about the cut as creating culture. And I just wondered your thoughts on the recut of the stone. <laughs> I agree. I don't know. I agree. Um, I never thought about it, never go through that, but um, I never went through this. But um, so I, I would I be agree? Well, the question is, sorry, because I think there's many yeah, there questions. There are multiple in there. So multiple the first, questions. did you consider the deconstruction of, of the building, of the, of the stones for it to be reused? No, because yes, we did, to be honest. 
But um, again, the joints are super powerful. And when you start the construction, we understood that you that you if you if you if you separate the two stones, there is something quite complicated uh, with the cement, not the cement, but the kind of glue that you use between the stones that 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 makes the, the construction not that easy. I I believed, I don't know, you know, but there's something quite complicated in this because we don't use the same the same plasters and the same the same materials as as as, as is antiquity. Also because of the 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 waterproofing that you were talking about. Um, so we did not consider it, but we know it's not that easy. It's, it, let's not be too naive about this. So, but then the recut would be very interesting. Yes, so recutting be, things. So you would be willing to work with salvaged stone. Yeah. From a demolition company. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Audrey, borrow this one. I think it takes 10 seconds I, to come up. Yes, I don't see this one. Sorry. I just, yeah, I had a, a question in my head since a while. Uh, it's, a, it's a question related really to our cultural relationship to stone and it touches on all your works. Um, I think, Thibault, you, you've done this exhibition on La Pierre, which in a way, it's quite absurd that you have to re represent, you know, the, the, the resource, the stone resource, the Bassin Parisien to the Parisian people. So, um, and that's also an exercise through which Rotor has to go through in, in order, you know, when, when they are dismantling the stone, they have to represent it in another way. So they really have to really liaise it to the audience, to a public. Uh, and I think you, Ruth, with your incredible work of, your urban geology work, uh, you know, these are all tentative of, of bringing the material stone closer to its people and, and to really try to close the, the, this, this gap of estrangement and detachment and cultural detachment. Uh, and so can we, so where is this coming from? Why have we been through decades of, of estrangement and detachment. Uh, if we take Michael's hypothesis of the concrete lobby being there for something, that could be par part of the answer, but I think it's a question that was hoovering um, to yes, the session, and so I was willing to maybe collect some words from you on that matter. Thank you. Yeah, I can just, just quickly try yeah. with some of that. And and also just response to the talks, which I think have been really interesting. And, um, and you know, very, I really enjoyed listening to Simon because, you know, actually that transition of being a geologist, i.e. somebody who works on rock, to being somebody who works on stone, um, came through me, through, came was absolutely down to classical archaeology for me. And, you know, identifying marbles um, in Roman buildings and you know and I think that that was the real start of this and but you know that transition of a rock to a stone is the cut it's exactly what you just said you know because um and then, then people say to me and I, so I'll just answer this question in case you're thinking aren't rocks and stone the same thing no they're not <laughs> rocks are in the natural environment and stone is in the built environment it's you know we are using stone and changing it into something else and actually most geologists are not interested in stone but I am but nevertheless for me it's it's that whole story and and I think you know one of the comments I'd like to make and people at Vitruvius and Pliny knew this is that you know stones are named they are we, we name them as geologists we name them we, we name rocks we name stones and again, it, again you made the analogy of the cheese which is an analogy I use really? all the time <laughs> which is you know you would never if you're reading a recipe book and it says you know you're going to make um, a souffle and, well, they might just say put some cheese in any cheese, but, you know, some, it will often say you use Stilton or use cheddar or use brie or whatever you're going to make. Um, we need to name those stones. We need to give them a name. And everybody today has talked about stone. You did at least mention the Eocene, Tibo, so I was <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I think that kind of relating these materials into a physical named thing 
you know, that almost do have a denomination contrôlé to them, you know. Mm. We, we've got to name them. And, and, and I find it actually as somebody who comes from a, an observation, as an observational and descriptive scientist, um, I hate it when I hear architects or archaeologists or people say, well, you know, this is all built out of the local stone. And I say, what is the local stone? And people go, um, limestone. <laughs> I'll go, is it a new light? Is it a sparite? Is it micrite? Is it chalk? You know, limestone is like 40 million rock types. Um, and um, yeah, you know, I think that, that kind of the subtlety of the difference of stone is important. And, it, you know, it, it might, you know, I think as, as architects and engineers, you might be interested in the um, engineering properties of those stones more than what they look like or what their fossils are or whatever. Um, but I would like to just encourage just, just to say what the name of the stone is. Because I spend a lot of time staring at buildings, trying to work out which rock this stone came from. And it, I, I love architects who say, I've used Shomarak stone or whatever, you know. You know what it is. And that kind of grounds me, literally with that, those materials. So, um, yeah, you know, I think it, it, there is interest in stone. Just put a name to it. These things are all, all named. Um, but, yeah, you know, I think, you know, there are all these synergies throughout space and time, which we've all talked about. And, um, and, and I'm real, also really, again, I'll be, I'll be really brief, but I'm also really interested in the way that stones move around the Roman Empire or, you know, across French uh, territories and colonies, as um, Michael was talking about with Prion's architecture. And, you know, again, I think people don't realise how much stone moves. And I think we should probably be more honest with that. But there's a lot to be said for using local stone as well. But, um, yeah, it's, it is about... The cultural cachet, isn't it? Which I think is a phrase that Simon used, and um, and that is still as relevant today as it was in second century Rome. And um, I think we, I don't know if we know. I, I I've always wondered if Pliny was just a nerd like me. I suspect he was. I suspect he was. I don't know how familiar your average Roman would have been. You know, between they was a differentiate between. Jello Antico and Cyros yellow limestones, uh, marbles. Um, so I don't know if it has been the province of nerds and stone collectors, but actually I, I would also like to say nerds, nerdy stone collectors are also a really important part of antiquity. I mean, you know, particularly, you know, every every stately home you go to, there's a nice specimen marble Pietro Dura table that somebody painstakingly robbed from <laughs> Roman sites <laughs> or was supplied by the Scalpellini, you know. Um, and so don't forget the interest. And I, I lead Urban Geology Walks, as you mentioned. And, you know, obviously COVID has had a big impact on that. But normally I take literally hundreds of people on walks, most of whom are not geologists, most of whom are not builders or architects. They just want accessible geology and they want to hear about, you know, this stone is 200 um, million years old, this stone is two billion years old, these are fossil squids or, you know, this is a granite from Egypt. People are just fascinated behind the stories of these materials, just as they are fascinated in the story behind where their food comes from. You know, and I'd like people to think of stone like we do think about food and wine. Where does it come from? What's its name? What is it? It's really important. And that goes back to what I said at the beginning about it not being sustainable. It's never going to grow back. So respect it for what it is. Thank you. Thank you. That's my half pens. <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder if we, we we're running over time, but it's so interesting. And um, I also thought that your your question about the cultural relationship, whether maybe um, Michael, just to conclude, Michael or Simon might like to answer that. Perhaps we've heard slightly less from from them? Um, I, I can give a two cents thing. I, I think for maybe the uh, uh, ancient world, I think that is uh, to, you know, to go back to this idea of naming stones, I think, you know, Pliny, um, I think 
you know, the Romans did were able to name these stones and did actually know them. I mean, Pliny actually, when he's writing about the different stones, actually says, like, they're far too well known for me to, that I don't need to describe them, they're very well known. Um, so I think that is, and I think that really does lend itself into the cachet of, of why um, stone is such a cultural phenomenon in the Roman period as well. You know, people did recognize where these come from and they did recognize them and that, so it gave them proper branding. And so that continued. So it's, I think that's really important to, uh, from my perspective, I think that is one of the keys why, you know, you see these again and again and again recycled, you know, these sorts of things. And, and if anything, you know, over time, they became even more so, you know, think about to go back to those comments of like, you know, stone being finite once it's sort of taken out or access is cut off to it. I'm, you know, mindful to think of the porphyry quarries, of course, in Egypt, which, you know, then there was no access to them. And the only way you could get that stone was literally to go some to some Roman building effectively to get it or then later other buildings. And so, you know, the, the, that's the medieval mindset, while in one sense, you know, for an historian of Rome, you know, I think, why in God's name did you dismantle this beautiful Roman building and, and strip it? Uh, but uh, from a medieval perspective, you know, this was uh, such a vital resource for them. This was where you could get the stone from. And they, you know, ruthlessly went after it. And I think if, you know, in a modern period, if, if we, you know, not to the destruction of heritage, but in a sense of appreciating the resource that, you know, would be, I think, is one of the kind of things we can pick out from antiquity. I just answer to Adeline, to your to your question. Uh, or Michael, you want to say something or no? No, go on, go on. Okay, sorry. <laughs> now, just to answer to Adeline's topic, which I think it's it's key. Um, the the first we did not to be to be really honest. Uh, we we far from being the first about talking about stone in France. I think it is important that Perrodin uh, was since maybe twenty five years uh, already. Uh, you know involving himself in the construction and before Puyo and everyone. So let's be modest. We, we just kind of surfed at some point on something that was already happening before us. And, and I think it is important because this was a motivation to express. And again, like you said, to, to the audience, the, 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 the means and, and, and the levels and the, and the, and the, and the ability to build with stone through this exhibition, yeah. So, but I think what you raise here is the topic of what's local and what's not. And uh, it is true that we believe here, I mean, in our practice that we have to, and this is what I tried to explain through this small installation in, in the Biennale, in the store of tripods, that it, the more local you are, the more you need to balance this, this idea of local with something which is universal. And I think we're trying, and Stone is, 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 is raising this topic more than other, you know, kind of, and sometimes you can see that um, it's the opposite when you use uh, materials coming from anywhere and you're trying to connect them with some very, to me, a picturesque and sophisticated relation with context. And I think Stone is raising quite the opposite. And I think there's something very interesting here in the way and the manipulation with stone of stones, and you're right, I have to be more precise and I haven't been <laughs> precise enough. And really no, 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 but you're definitely, so it's Pierre de Bretignac. <laughs> <laughs> that, that we used in Rio Berco. Oh, so it's a 44 million, 44 million uh, uh, yeah. old uh, stone. Yes, yeah. Okay, so I'll be more precise next time, but you're definitely right. And, uh, you you yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think this idea of local, universal, I think we have to to use, you know, this modernity, this like Bruno Latour is coming off, he's, he's calling, he's separating the, the, the good global and the bad global. Modernity bring two things, the good and the bad. I mean, the bad in like the way that territories do not produce resource anymore and you let yourself use something from coming from anywhere in the world. But it also bring um, access to knowledge and, and through internet and through many things and through you know universal culture that 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 is that is a, 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 a an infinite um, you know source of 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 of, of cultures 
And, and through that exhibition that we did, we say, okay, if you start using stone, I mean, in a local way, you have to balance that uh, to something which is more related to other context, other you know, part of the world. And I think this is yeah. what we're very interested in. And this is a, to us, some kind of a quest, uh, a quest sorry, we are trying to, to, to follow now. Yeah, I thought those, um, I didn't know about that Japanese wood stone bonding technique, they're absolutely beautiful. Yeah, yeah it's, it's marvelous knowledge as well, yeah. yeah. I, I think, Unfortunately, I think we're going to have to oh, stop okay. to have something to Thank eat you. for lunch. But, but um, there's so much more to discuss, and I, I hope everyone will join us for this afternoon, where session two um, will start at two o'clock. Um, but thank you so much um, to our speakers this morning. It's been really wonderful. Uh, Thibaut Barriol, Simon Barker online, thank you so much for joining us. So rich and interesting, and also um, Michael Gayut, your your presentation is really fascinating about the post war and the kind of really want to ask you lots more about you know design build contracts all kinds of things. But anyway, for another maybe later that might come up, and also so much to Ruth as our respondent this morning. Thank you very much, and hope to see you all at two. Thank you.